Welcome to today's Industry Insights webinar, Integrating AI in Higher Education, Navigating Challenges and Shaping Policy. My name is Jason Martin. I'm an online event, event production manager at Educause, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Our panelists will introduce themselves in just a second, but I, I want to give you a brief orientation on our learning environment. We hope you'll join us in making our session interactive. To do so, please open the chat by clicking the chat icon at the bottom of the presentation window. Please use the chat throughout the webinar to make comments, share resources, and to pose questions for our presenters. When you do so, please be sure to select everyone from the chat dropdown so that you can engage with all participants. We encourage you to type your questions into the chat throughout the webinar, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can in our Q&A. We are also using the uh, reactions, uh, so please do feel free to use those throughout the presentation and let us know that that's working. We're very excited about that. And if you have any technical issues, you can send me a private message by selecting hosts and panelists in the chat dropdown. With that, thank you so much for joining us today, and I'll hand things over to you, Johan. Thank you so much, Jason, and welcome everyone to today's uh, webinar. My name is Johan Zimmer, and I'm based in San Francisco, and I'm the education uh, strategy lead for Zoom. Uh, we are today hosting this event in a co-sponsored fashion with AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services, and Zoom. And uh, we are excited to be here with you. We believe at Zoom that the future will continue to be hybrid. Our mission is to transform academic and administrative environments by delivering a unified communications platform, which is now called Zoom Workplace. And if you have upgraded your Zoom client, you may see that logo on your uh, top left corner. Uh, we help accelerate interactions and create, uh, create dynamic, accessible learning experiences, improve collaboration across the connected campus, and make learning more engaging. Uh, with that, I will hand it over to our moderator today, Dustin Ferguson, and I'll let him introduce himself. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Johan. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, as Johan said, I'm a uh, customer success manager here at Zoom and, and uh, I have the pleasure of moderating today's discussion. Also wanna introduce um, uh, the main show for, the, for today, which is uh, Dan Yaffe, he's a learning technology specialist at Virginia Tech and India Francis, who's a senior IT analyst at the University of Chicago. So India, I will um, hand it over to you to introduce a little bit about um, your institution. Sure, hi everyone. Um, I'm India, obviously from Chicago. Um, at our institution, we have um, a wide variety of people, a demographic makeup. So as you can see, we have about, um, about a little under 30,000 students, um, 9,000 faculty, um, a little over 20,000 staff. And then as part of our Chicago Medicine, um, we have about 18,000. So as you can see, we have a wide variety of makeup of people in our university. Thanks, India. Dan? Hello, everybody. My name's Dan Yaffe. I'm from Virginia Tech. Uh, right now, we have about 38,000 undergrad and graduate students, around 9,000 employees. And overall, we have 101,000 um, Zoom users on, on campus or associated with the campus. And the other thing I wanted to add were the Zoom products we currently have, meetings, webinars, events, Zoom phone, contact center. Uh, we've run the gamut of services from Zoom. Thank you both. Um, perfect. And with that, we can jump into our discussion for today. I do want to launch a quick poll. Um, so as we go, we have three poll questions throughout the webinar just to gauge some interaction from our audience today. So if you could um, take a minute, answer that poll question. Um, and I, as you um, give you some time to answer that first uh, question, Dan, we'll start with you. Um, I, I, I put a graphic here. Um, up on our slides, everything that you see from um, a data perspective is from the 2024 Educause AI landscape study, um, which I believe Jason's going to throw the link to that study in the chat. Um, so lots of good content and data there. Um, so Dan, as we think about, you know, this, uh, our first topic, when we're thinking about, you know, planning for AI, um, what was your experience like at, at Virginia Tech once I think ChatGPT was released. I think everyone was kind of forced to think about this and and um, you know wrestle with the implications. So, what was that experience like for you at Virginia Tech? 
Yeah, so at, at Virginia Tech, when everything came about, um, I would say that the title of the slide is absolutely what we were. We were cautiously optimistic. We were looking forward to the future and trying to figure out how can we proceed safely and give people choices for, for what they want. Um, so with the specific Zoom features of AI, um, when they came out, we were already we already had some working groups of faculty that myself and my AVP were, were leading. So we kicked it over to them, got feedback from them. And we also put a survey out to the community to get feedback from the community. And all along, it really did show that everybody was cautiously optimistic um, to get, to take the next step. Um, once we figured out what people wanted, we put it, higher up the food chain. And the one really good thing was that the AI features that we were looking at enabling specifically with Zoom and some other, as well as some other companies were with Zoom, they were very granular and people had a choice. We could turn them on and leave them unlocked and let people make the best decision for what they needed for their given circumstance. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing, Dan. I think, um, yeah, and, and as we saw, I shared the results of the poll. Um, that seems to be the sentiment amongst uh, most people is that, you know, with some some caution and optimism, there was kind of a mix of, of a little bit of everything when, when thinking about how to integrate AI um, on a broader scale in higher ed. So um, thank you for that. India, I'll toss this one over to you. Um, as you know, in that planning phase, what was the feedback like from the customers that you serve? Obviously, in your role, you're, you know, um, you're working with faculty and staff and, and students at times as well. Um, what were they asking for or were they asking for AI tools? Um, yeah, share your perspective on, on that. Sure. Yeah. As you can imagine, with anything, you know, new and unknown, um, unknown we have a subset of people who, of course, like want to jump right in. You know, you have your students who want everything all at once. And then you have your faculty who are a little more hesitant. But with AI being such a broad term, we had a lot of questions ranging from like data and privacy. How is it being protected? What's being done with my data? And then so what features are available and when can it be enabled? And then we had some things like, oh, never enable this. I never want to see it. Like, <laughs> so, of course, we had a really broad range of questions that, that we had to work through in the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I um, I hate to bring this up because it's almost behind us, but um, what what about third party meeting bots and how did that play into your decision to um, <laughs> to enable certain features? Because I know that that's been a common discussion, you know, as as AI tools like, um, you know, Otter AI and others were uh, were kind of making their way into our meetings. Um, did that play into your decision at all in, in that planning phase? Yeah, it did. Of course, we're always looking for options to make tasks easier with so many people using third party apps and the majority for translation features. Um, but of course, the saying goes there are too many cooks in the kitchen. So um, with those app, with those third party apps, of course, it's hard to manage. And then um, they offer different features. So we were very happy to get one solution where everybody could do the same thing. And, and it's a lot easier to manage that way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and Dan, um, back to you. So what about now that some of these AI features have been enabled at Virginia Tech for um, a couple of months or a few months now, um, what has the user feedback been like or what has kind of the um, general sentiment been like after a few months of usage? Sure, the uh, user feedback I've been getting is for the people that are trying it and using it and being cautiously optimistic, there's two things that are really standing out. Um, the smart recordings with the next steps and the summary are very well received. Uh, people, not only for classes, but administrative functions are using them. I know some people are going into Zoom rooms and holding a physical meeting in a Zoom room just so it can be recorded, so it can be transcribed and the, and the next steps take place there. And the other AI feature is part of the smart recording, but the speech code, the, coach, the coaching features. I do know some of our communications faculty 
or having students just record themselves and take some of the ums and uhs out of there, slow down their speech and get some feedback from, from that. That's awesome. That's very helpful to, to hear that perspective. Um, so moving right on, right along into our next topic, um, as we, we think about, you know, uh, you know, enabling certain AI tools, um, there's a lot to think about. I think India, you touched on it with privacy and security, but, you know, other, um, other policies and things to, to consider. So, um, India, what, what challenges did you face as you were planning for these t tools and um, this new technology? What kind of roadblocks did you run into? Oh, India, you are, you're muted. And I just thought I clicked it. Okay. Um, but of course we had, um, you know, challenges because we had to scale so quickly when these, when AI features come out. Um, we had some groups had more strict regulations than others. So navigating what couldn't be enabled and what couldn't be enabled was a process. But it was great that we found that some um, of the AI features, they could be enabled on the user level, on a group's level. So that really helped a lot when determining what could be turned on and turned off. And then, of course, like I stated before, ensuring the protection of our sensitive data. So like working through FERPA and HIPAA posed a few roadblocks, um, but our different teams and then um, the different teams had to come together. So you have your privacy and, and data team, you know, coming with their desktop support team. So it took a lot of collaboration from different teams to to make it happen. And then you have your like general technical aspects of is everybody's client updated? You know, make sure everybody has access to these features. So um, that and then creating user documentation from scratch. So how to train and thinking about um, the best way to get user adoption with some of the things. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for, for sharing that. And Dan, kind of on the same topic, and I'm going to throw the slide back up here so we can see, um, you know, and this this probably resonates with, with a lot of folks, but um, what about at Virginia Tech? What was it like? with uh, privacy and security when it comes to a new technology like AI, that's always mm -hmm. the first question you get. So um, how, how did you navigate that in, in, in your Absolutely. experience? Absolutely, with any vendor that is putting AI features into their, into their product, whether it's a chat GPT or whatever vendor, um, we definitely have to take a look from a legal perspective and from an IT security office perspective and see what is appropriate uh, the great thing was, uh, like India said, was we do have very granular controls to release it to certain subsets and let people make the best decision because we do have researchers that are teaching classes. So they need it for teaching classes for two hours, but then they need to go and do something where they can't have the AI in it. Um, the one thing I will say was having the ability to make that choice of having it on or off and the at the end user was very significant. And then being the terms being built into the contract, the small addendum was still referencing all of the original contract terms that we had with Zoom definitely expedited uh, making that decision. Yeah, definitely. Um, thank you, Dan. And I wanna go ahead and launch our second poll question here so we can um, just gauge, you know, what are what are some of the challenges that you're facing as we're talking about it with um, through through India and Dan's uh, perspective, um, would love to get a feel for how everyone is kind of navigating what what are the, you know, uh, the hot topics at your institution as well that, that you're having to face. Um, so, um, you know, as we think about, you know, these challenges and and um, and conversations that um, you know, we're, uh, we're having around privacy, security, uh, policy. How did that shape uh, your policy, India, at University of Chicago? And, and how are you, um, you know, approaching that process to enable new tools and evaluating, uh, you know, new features or new things to, um, uh, to adopt on, on your campus? Yeah, so a little goes a long way in user adoption. So not releasing all the features at one time has been beneficial and helped us to, to draw back and kind of scale. 
Um, and myself as someone who's responsible for training and aiding users in adoption, and I'm a visual and hands-on learner myself, so it's important for me to understand and try out the new AI features before they're released to our users. And then once I gain a clear understanding, we're able to provide like clear user direction and documentation and just be able to get ahead of the curve and answer any questions uh, that may arise. And uh, we also provide like an extensive FAQ page um, and, and just keep it running and updated. And then like general pages about different features and how-to articles about how to use the specific features that kind of drill down into the, the tiny aspects of it. And um, of course, we always welcome feedback and we really use it to drive our decisions uh, with different AI tools. So these approaches really help us stay, a, stay ahead of the curve so we can effectively integrate the new tools and enhance our educational experience. Awesome, thank you for sharing that. It's helpful perspective to have. Um, Dan, I know that, you know, and, and based on everyone's um, results and their answers in the poll, um, the, the number one answer for challenges mm -hmm. that we face is academic integrity and ethical use when it comes to, I think, specifically students. And so I want to ask you, um, you know, what has that conversation looked like? What's your perspective on, you know, generative AI tools and how students are using them um, and the policy that you've you know, shaped at, at Virginia Tech? So that is definitely a, a heated conversation where we got both ends of the spectrum, very vocal. And I think most people are starting to come towards the middle on it. I think one of the big things about being cautiously optimistic and recognizing that AI isn't going away and it is a more of a major game changer than what we've seen in the last decade, 20 years. Um, given the range of majors and perceived use by faculty that how students are using it. I think the one thing that has helped the most is empowering the faculty member to address their students and give them the standards that they want them to follow by. So put the blurb in your um, syllabus and say, these are the expectations and this is how I want you to follow it. Some faculty don't, don't mind it and want to use it, actually want to use it in their class actively and other ones just don't want any part of it um don't don't use it for anything so there's a time and place for everything and i could see both sides of the argument but letting the faculty put their standards out for what how they want it used and then expect the students to respect those wishes and and proceed i like that i like the empowering the faculty um to, to kind of enforce their own standards so that's um that's really good thank you dan and um, India, I want to um, uh, maybe open a can of worms here. I don't know, but um, I think, you know, amongst my, my conversations with universities is that the number one obstacle or challenge that we face in higher ed is, you know, student retention. I think anyone, um, everyone can agree with that. Recruiting students, uh, how do we retain the students that we have? Um, do you see, and these may be two separate conversations, but I, I Curious to hear you weigh in. Does AI and adopting, you know, new innovative AI tools um, help with that um, that issue that we're facing with student retention at all? Um, and if so, how? I'd love to hear you um, your perspective there. Yeah, it does. And um, one of the main things that we focus on at the University of Chicago is accessibility. So especially with that, um, different integrations with our LMS platforms and um, AI tools that enhance um, accessibility for students with disability, such as like those transcription services and um, the different adaptive interfaces and, and captions that really helps with um, student retention and understanding within the classroom environment. And then also being able to um, tailor orientations and learning processes um, and programs that really cater to individual needs of the students um, instead of more like a broader audiences. And we've seen AI platforms that can tailor content to individual needs and learning styles and improve engagement. Very good. Thank you for that. That's, that's really helpful. Um, so before we move on to our next question, I do want to pause for some Q&A. Um, 
Van in India, if you're okay with that. I think there's a couple questions that we could we could tackle. Um, the first one is um, from John. He asked, you know, slightly related to privacy and security, how did you help a the AIs navigate old, out outdated data? And he gave an example of like a roster from 2015 so that they wouldn't advise users with bad information. Um, I think he's talking about um, like, you know, training the models and things like that. So uh, any any advice or want to weigh in on that question? So I'll, th I'll take this one. So I know at this point, um, we at Virginia Tech, we aren't actively training any models on the education side, on the research side. I know we are, but I know on the education side, when we're looking at AI features or AI in general, we really are looking for part of the security is how can we decide what to give it exactly? Um, so when we're looking at what we want out of the results and how what we're really looking for, we do have to pick the data sets that we want to provide and not just say, take this whole Amazon S3 bucket and go through it. Um, so you still, it's, it's very similar to survey design. You still have to work backwards a little know what your end goal is and decide what the best information to put in there is. Thank you, Dan. And uh, another question, um, and again, whoever wants to take this one from Monica, um, regarding the opt-in or opt-out disclaimers, um, how often do you see people declining participation in a meeting because the AI companion is turned on? Um. Personally, we don't see it a lot. We may have had one instance of that I'm aware of so far um, since we had it released. Um, but something that really helps with that is the letting the users know everything that they're getting within when we release the AI features. So then they can educate their participants in meetings and they can do that ahead of time whether they're being blindsided by different features within a meeting when they join. Dan, anything to add on that? I know internally, I've only received one report of a ticket where somebody did something unexpected and couldn't join. They expected that when they hit the decline, they would still stay in the meeting. Um, but I do know that there are a couple exter external partners we work with that certain departments have not turned on some of the features just because they work enough with external partners right now that aren't willing to use it. Yeah. And just a quick Zoom plug too, that we do have a new feature where you can um, you can customize the disclaimers that um, that are uh, that pop up in your meeting when AI Companion is turned on. So it's a helpful new tool there. Just uh, just FYI for everyone. Um, another question from Tony: um, Have there been discussions about AI's impact on library licensing? For instance, libraries pay for limited access to Articles, ebooks, et cetera, um, but using this content with AI may constitute a violation of these licenses. So, as far as uh, libraries go, has that been a part of your discussions at all, Dan or India? That has not been part of my discussions that I've been aware of. I do know we always have discussions about what you are using for your classroom materials and how you're linking it in the in the LMS, but I'm not aware of anything like that right now. Yeah, same for us. Okay, no problem. Um, perfect. Well, I want to, um, we'll get back to some Q&A here at the end of our session. Um, I do want to launch our third poll. So third and final, um, if we could get your, um, uh, have everyone weigh in again on that poll question. And, um, and so Dan, back to you about you know, kind of looking ahead at, at what's next, you know, I think that we can all agree AI is not slowing down anytime soon. So um, what excites you the most about AI? We've, we've kind of covered challenges and, and obstacles, but um, what, what are some benefits or what excites you about um, artificial intelligence? I think the one thing that there's, there's two things I'll point to. Uh, one is, one is personal and that is just the efficiency, the efficiency of going through email and going through contracts and going through other things has greatly improved and just getting some insight that I would have never picked apart from my own personal user data. 
um, excites me. And the one for students is really the idea of a student tutor where they can get tutoring in any subject that they want. It's customizable and having that tutor be able to address them on a one-on-one -on -one level on a, to better understand the material. So I think that's what really excites me from a higher ed standpoint. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure a lot can, uh, can agree with that. And um, it looks like from the poll, uh, about 70% answered increased productivity and proficiency. So they agree with you there, Dan, and uh, an academic innovation, which I think um, definitely falls in line with what you're talking about with the student tutor. Um, lots of, lots of um, exciting possibilities there. So um, India, final question before we jump back into some Q and A. Um, so what's next, you know, what are you hearing is in your role, what's the next phase of AI? What is the University of Chicago talking about now that we've kind of been through that, you know, uh, the integral initial phase of kind of adopting some tools? Um, what do we have to look forward to? Um, so we're continuing to collaborate with the AI vendors and um, other educational institutions, you know, to stay afloat of new developing um, best practices and the technologies that's come out. Um, I love collaborating with others at different universities to see the feedback from students and faculty. And um, yeah, that's been really beneficial. And um, it just helps us leverage their expertise and really accelerate user adoption, uh, adoption in the future. And of course, um, keeping up with the times, we wanted to broaden the scope of AI application and continue to ensure that, you know, we're doing it ethical and we have an equitable use between everyone. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you for that. And um, we want to jump back into some Q&A and I'll stop sharing so we can just have a discussion here. So um, one question from Linda um, is, I think, a good one. She said, do your universities have programs to offset the environmental impact of AI? So I'll I'll start first. Um, at this point, no, I, I am not aware of any policy at the at a policy level that has been introduced. Um, I do know that we have several things in the works that could potentially address that, but I know that has been thought of. But at this point, due to the rapid movement of AI and I'll just say the slower movement of policy at a university, um, they have not crossed, they have not caught up to one another yet. Got it. Thank you, Dan. Um, yes, I just got a chat that said, can we share the results of the last poll? So I'm going to throw those up there and um, tackle the next question. So um, Julia asked, you know, maybe this is too, too uh, niche of a question, um, but uh, if any of you have experience with this, would love for you to weigh in. How do you prepare for AI integration on a campus that has dual enrollment? So, you know, thinking about high school students or students that are um, under, under 18. So any special like implications or considerations there? I'll, I'll take that one. We actually do have, <laughs> yeah. we uh, do have quite a few programs from um, being an agricultural college ag extension and dual enrollment. Uh, we do have quite a bit of, of students under the age of 18. And everything we put in our LMS or is accessible from our LMS and the FERPA data, uh, we do mark, um, faculty do know what is appropriate to use and what is not appropriate to use. And if somebody is under 18 and the tool is not appropriate for them to use, they should be offered an alternative assignment or a more inclusive way to get them to into the group work. Um, I will not say it's a perfect system. There's always those gaps, just like with everything. It's a, it is a niche area, uh, but I do know that is one reason why the um, ag ex or agriculture extension agents over the summer at all the camps they do, most of their students are under the age of 18. So they are holding off right now. And I will say- from... the same, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. 
Oh, I was about to say, and the same for us. Um, we do have dual enrollment. So, um, and we do a lot of leaning on our faculty to educate their students on, on what to not to do. Um, and then we also work with administration to limit some features. You know, every quarter we go through and um, see what features are enabled, see um, what, what changes need to be made. So we do do a quarterly review of, of different features from, from that aspect. Thanks, India and Dan. And you know, from a Zoom perspective, I know that, you know, for, uh, speaking to our AI companion uh, suite of features that, um, you know, not all of them are approved for um, accounts that serve students under the age of 18. Um, as we work to, you know, um, become compliant with COPPA and things like that, we're rolling those features out. That's the goal. Um, but, you know, if you if your account does consent to, um, you know, using our, our features and tools for students under 18, then you will get a limited set of AI features that um, that are COPPA compliant. So um, just FYI, kind of from, from a Zoom perspective. Um, a good question here from Alyssa. Um, did your universities feel the need to develop a university-wide AI policy? And if so, what did you consider when developing it? And how specific did you get concerning appropriate use? You um, go ahead, Dan, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll start. I'll, I'll start. Um, so I think Virginia Tech was one of the earlier um, institutions that put out an AI statement about what we, how we wanted it to use, but it was not an official policy. We're still in the process of forming an official policy. Um, the term cautiously optimistic came up a lot in our policy and leaving the use cases and how it was gonna be used up to the faculty member at this point. Um, right now, that is where we stand. I know that there are multiple policy working groups working on this right now. And I believe Virginia Tech is hoping to have an official policy out before the start of the fall semester. Um, but I think right now everybody is saying, do what you're comfortable with and what makes sense in your specific use cases. India, anything to add on that university-wide policy question? Yep, I think we're we're about the same. We're adding um, to the policies, and when right now we're providing a, a guidance around AI um, because it's coming so fast in so many different forms. You know, it takes time to to put together all that into one huge policy, and especially with um, higher education institution, it's a lot of different different pockets. You know, um, a lot of different moving pieces to get everybody on board with that. Right. As I say, I'll add one more thing going back to it is when it first came out, everybody was worried about the, the written word of large language models, but now it's pictures, it's video, it's audio. Um, so even when the first policy comes out, there's going to be addendums multiple times as a new form comes out. Yeah, absolutely. It's ever evolving. Um, so I'm sure that there'll be a, um, an ongoing process. I want to um, hit a couple of other questions. Um, uh, Elias asked, what type of AI tools? Um, you gave the examples of like student tutors, which Dan, I think you brought up earlier. Do you provide access to at your campuses? And do you have campus-wide um, subscriptions for those tools? So maybe outside of you know, the Zoom tools that are included in your, your current subscription, um, anything else to, to add there of other tools that you may be using? So the first couple that come to mind that everybody could have access to, they were not essentially paid for by the university, but if you had an Adobe license, which you can get through the university, you could get some of the Adobe AI features. Um, Microsoft Copilot was actually the first tool on campus that all faculty had access to, and then shortly after all faculty, staff, and students had access to, and that is in a walled garden per se. It is under our Microsoft contract. Um, those are the two big ones that stick out right now. We do not currently have a campus-wide license for chat, chat GPT um, or anything like that, but we are able to finally, individuals are able to purchase licenses at this point um, within the last month or so if they want to use it. 
Yep, yeah, pretty much the same that. for us. Um, we're working through um, Copilot, and of course, we have um, all the Zoom features um, available um, right now in higher education. So that was that was our um, big announcement um, to have everybody on board with that. Was really the Zoom feature is something they use all the time. Yeah. Really, thank you both. Um, let's see, I'm looking through our questions here. See what we want to tackle next. Um, so um, an individual asks, would it be up to each faculty member to decide on an AI policy with their um, course uh, VS, I'm not sure what VS is, um, a broad one to cover everyone? So I guess the question is asking, you know, is it up to every faculty member to kind of come up with their own AI policy or is that, you know, the, the university-wide policy, a, you know, um, binding, I guess, um, if you will. So at this point, I think Andy has said it best where everything we've put out in the initial was guidance. So the group I work in, Telos, did help form an initial AI guidance statement for faculty to put in their uh, syllabus, and it gave them the leeway to give the expectations of how they wanted it used. I will say in the future, that probably will be different and they will be referring to policy, which is a lot different than different than guidance at the at a in a higher ed institution. Um, that is a question that is yet to be handled. Um, but faculty do uh, Virginia Tech faculty do have a lot of leeway within their courses and how they want to teach and their expectations. So in theory, they, they could, each faculty member could do something for each different class if they really wanted to, but I don't think that's gonna happen. Awesome, thanks, Dan. And um, another question from George, she asked, have your institutions placed AI governance with an existing office on campus or um, have they created new offices for, um, you know, specifically for AI governance? Not for us. Um, it's still kind of, uh, like I said, it works through different teams right now. That that could be something that happens in the future as more, um, you know, different features are released from different, um, different companies. Um, but a, a big start is the privacy and security office and, you know, the law office to read all of the the, the wording. And so it kind of just flows through different teams right now. We, we also have not, we, we have not created any new specific offices. And I would say it was the typical um, offices that were already working together on the research side or the education side or the policy side that are coming together to talk about this. And this is, this is probably one of the things that I've noticed is research and at least at Virginia Tech, research and education and the policy side are probably interacting more now than ever to figure out how to do this and what everybody else is doing. So we're not contradicting each other and saying you can use it here in this 20 minutes, but not here in this 20 minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And um, question from, from Chris, about um, you know students and and their um, their use of of AI tools, generative AI tools. He said, with no data contracts in place with Apple or Google, how do we help protect our students from themselves so that our students who have rapidly charged forward from shooting themselves in the foot by using large language models and generative AI systems that have or could release their data into the wild. So specifically for, you know, student data privacy, any, any advice there? The one thing I've seen is this goes back to in the last 15 years about teaching data literacy or news literacy and not believing it or not buying into fake news and being able to distinguish it. I do see that coming up a lot more in classes that are going to be taught of I'll just call it technology literacy or or AI literacy. What are the dangers? What's appropriate? What's what's not appropriate to to use? 
India, anything to add there or? No, um, no, I was, I was thinking along the same lines of um, the education on, on students in the part of, of data literacy is, is very new. Um, of course, we, we have different things and we, we use them right away, but we don't know the implications of it. So faculty educating the students and then faculty learning it themselves is going to be very important to the to progression of AI. Yeah, absolutely. I can see that as um, evolving over time as well, right? You know, educating students and like kind of almost a new um, uh, a new course of study um, is is how to how to use these tools responsibly and ethically. Um, a question from Jonathan. Um, you know, he said AI Zoom features create a different type of data concern instead of typical data privacy. AI Zoom features open up concerns about accidentally sharing private conversations. You know, I think it's probably speaking to like the meeting summary feature. And based on this new type of concern, any advice about employee trainings or knowledge based articles when, um, you know, when it comes to um, sharing settings, configurations, or policies around that? Yeah, well, good thing is uh, about that, um, the sharing aspect can be limited to um, only the host. So um, instead of it being automatically sent to all participants, um, you can change the option to only have the host be able to send it. And then as far as like with Zoom summaries, the host receives a summary, they can edit it, they can they can change anything that's inaccurate and then go ahead and, and send it out. So I think educating the users on how to do that um, once these once these features are released and and go into their own pro profiles and and see what they can do it really helps with that. Absolutely, thank you, India. Um, Kevin asks, what steps can higher education entities take to avoid plagiarism with AI? And this is this, is this conversation that you've um, you know you've seen or been a part of so far. And this is probably the one thing that I think we've probably already been through and you can relate it to other technologies and students are always going to find a way to plagiarize or go around the system no matter what. So that's where it comes down to how you structure your course, how you structure your assessments. What are you asking for? Are you asking for written word? Or are you asking for group projects, presentations? Um, some instructional design can, can help offload some of the AI concerns um, for plagiarism, but you're going to have plagiarism no matter what at some level, at whatever institute you're at. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another question from Christopher, he asked, how do you see AI helping educators improve their assessments and the accessibility of their content? Do you see that um, improving? You know, for educators at all. Yeah, I definitely um, see it, especially on the accessibility side. Um, we have uh, different people asking for, at first it was captions, and then people had to, to type the captions manually, and they had to hire a captionist. But um, with different features like translated captions or automatic captions, that has made it um, a lot more accessible to, to students to be able to successfully um, go through their classes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And from the assess from the assessment side, AI will definitely help with the analytics and be able to map mapping content content not only between students and faculty, but at the programmatic level, and making sure learning objectives are clear and they're actually being assessed. And what is the point of the like what is the point of what we're doing when something gets uh, certified by the state? Uh, like, are we actually teaching these objectives and is that in there? Mm. No, that's a great point. Thank you both. Um, just a couple more questions and then we're, we're almost ready to, um, to close. But Dan asked, sorry if this has already been asked, I don't think it has. Um, if you enabled Zoom AI tools, which um, both of you have, did you limit the tools to the uh, the ZMO, which is the Zoom model only, so it only uses Zoom's large language models? 
um, rather than going with their external models as well. Um, so I'll tackle that one first. He has a second part to the question, but um, did he either of you use the, the ZMO model? So we didn't, at Virginia Tech, we really didn't have that choice because we recently signed a BAA. Um, so we, we had a choice for about three days and then we actually signed the BAA and we were given the Zoom, um, the Z ZML. Got it. Stand. In India, yeah, I'll let you speak to that one too. Yep, I was going to say same for us. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. Um, I think that answered all of his questions. So last question from Dexter is, um, are there different policies and guidance for staff rather than faculty? Um, we're facing a similar situation, he says. We released guidance, but now faculty um, are moving into the policy arena, and we expect our policy guidelines to focus first on staff, not faculty from an IT standpoint. So any, any, um, yeah, any perspective there on different policies for staff versus faculty? We have not. We've treated um, them the same. And as you can see from our initial um, numbers between the University of Chicago and Virginia Tech, Virginia Tech doesn't have as many instructors and full-time faculty, and they're serving administrative duties as, as well um, to a large extent. So we are treating them all the same. Stan, India, anything to add? Yeah, we have a um, general guidance, which co will cover um, faculty and staff alike, but then we also have um, a um, subset that just covers teachers uh, teaching and learning, um, responsibility for content accuracy, um, academic integrity. So, so we have a, a few different things, um, but we have one generative AI um, intelligence guide that, that covers a lot of different things and then links to, to other ones. Great, thank you, thank you both. I think we've covered all of the questions. Um, that was a lot, thank you all for the attendees uh, for, for your questions and your participation. We really appreciate it. And thanks to India and Dan for, um, uh, for handling those on, on the spot. And uh, we really appreciate that. So um, that's it from, from me, Jason. I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add before uh, we close for today. Yeah, thank you all. What a wonderful discussion. Um, please uh, also notice that Johan put in that they will, the Zoom will be at the annual conference, October 21st through 24th. I believe the registration for that just opened this week. Um, also, a couple of other links to draw your all uh, attentions to. Uh, we have the uh, survey for today's session. We really do take uh, into account your feedback, so please fill that out. Uh, also, the recording will be made available later today on the website. Uh, and I just want to draw your attention while we are all here on the subject of AI to the demo day that is coming up. It is free for all, whether you're a member or not of Educause, uh, and that is going to be on the 24th later this month. So we have eight, eight presenters there as well. So we really look forward to seeing you again. Thank you all so much, and thank you to our panelists for your expertise and discussion.